have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn back to John, John chapter 8. I sent uh, TJ uh, the messages for today, and I think it was like, for the screen up here, like three long pages. I never do that. It's usually a half a page or something. And I had two messages for today, but it just looks like that I'm not going to get through with this one. So we'll have to go to the next one next week. And of course, it is on, unless the Lord changes my mind. It is on our um, series that we've been doing, Contend for the Faith. But I'm going to be going to some different scripture on that out of Matthew chapter 7. Not tonight, but probably next week. And um, I, I like to preach that message too. So anyway, we'll get to that. Let's all stand tonight. And we're going to read out of John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And we are on this subject of new beginnings, a new life new start, all things new, and that's exactly what Christ does for us when he saves us. Aren't you glad tonight you're saved? I tell you, I went home today, and I was sitting there, and I was just thinking to myself, man, it is good to be saved. It's good, yeah. Michael and Judy's granddaughter got saved today. Matthew Slimp's daughter got saved today at church. Isn't that good? Yeah. The Bible says Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us, that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up his, uh, himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, who are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's a good story, isn't it? But you know what? It's not just a story. It's truth. It's truth that is played out in life every day, just like this young girl got saved today. It's truth played out. That we're all sinners. All of us. And we all need a Savior. And Jesus is the Savior. Let's thank him for the reading of his word. Father, we love you. We lift you up and magnify you. You're worthy of our praise tonight. Thank you for bringing us back this way again. Now, Father, we pray tonight that our heart will be given totally to you. That we will surrender tonight to you. To hear your word and to react to your word. Now, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will move among us tonight. Touch each life. Help us to never be the same because we've been preached to and taught the word of God. In your precious sweet name we pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Now go to somebody and tell them you love them. You don't have to stay in your seat. You can walk around. Well, when we started this sermon this morning, we talked about how that seems like in life in general, that people are always, uh, are always looking for a newness about their life. They change this, they change that. You know, they change places where they live, places where they work, because they think that this is what brings happiness to them. And they want a new beginning in their life. They're looking for that perfect place 
that they can settle in at and that's where they're, they're, they will be and everything will be great. But how many of you know tonight that that's just simply not the fact? That in this life we will always have those times of sorrow. We'll have those times of our valley experiences. We can't always live on the mountain. We have to go through these times. But what sustains us? What in our life can we have in our life that will not put us in that perfect place where we're there all the time, but that place that sustains us? That's the reason we as Christians, it should be a normal thing to groan for heaven. We groan for heaven because it is a place that we know is going to be that place of solitude, that place of no stress, no heartaches, none of those things are going to happen in heaven. And so every day as Christians, we live to go to heaven. That's what we live for. But I'm here to tell you tonight that you really don't have to live your life just waiting until you get to heaven to be happy. Because with Jesus in our heart and in our life tonight, as I try to explain this morning, in our heart and life, with Jesus in our heart and life, we're different. We're not the same as this old world. We don't belong here. One of these days we're going to be taken out of here. And the things that are here are sometimes strange to us. But in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we can have that peace that passes all understanding. So as I said this morning, if I were the devil, what I would try to do to Christians, because he knows that he doesn't have you, but what I would try to do to Christians if I was the devil is take that peace away. To take that place that you know you are with the Lord Jesus Christ, that place that we were in this morning and we're in tonight, that place of peace and happiness, even though there's trouble, trials, and heartache, there's still peace and happiness in our heart through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the devil's job is to take that away from us. And that's what he wants to do. So this morning, we related this in this sermon of Jesus as this woman was brought to her. We related all of this in this sermon to how these men that brought this woman were. The first thing about them is they were accusers. They, they brought the accusations about this woman, but they were malicious in doing it. They were malicious because, first of all, they had already passed judgment upon her. They had already said, because they lived under the law, they had already said that this woman should be stoned, and because the law says that she should be stoned, that surely Jesus would agree with them. But what they didn't understand about Jesus is Jesus came to bring grace and mercy. He came to bring that to a world that was lost. And so this was a group determined, but they were a group of self-righteous people. And by the way, folks, if we don't watch it, we can fall into a category that we probably don't want to be into. This, this self-righteous bunch. That all they wanted to do was find fault. That's all... They, they ever wanted to do, that's all they thought about, was to judge and to find fault in other people. They were perfect, but other people had faults. They were self-righteous. The characteristics of their lives, and I hope that you check yourself tonight as I've checked myself, the characteristics of the life of these men were there was no grace in them at all. No grace. No forgiveness. In these men were only in them was spite and malicious intent. They hated other people. We live in a world tonight that is full of hate. 
The second thing that we looked at about these men is they were mistaken. You see, they didn't think with all of their heart or they would have never brought this woman to Jesus. They didn't think in all of their imagination that Jesus would ever forgive her. They didn't think that he would ever, you know, uh, forgive her of this sin. This was a horrible sin. It was so bad that the law said she dies for this sin. Judgment was passed quickly with no remorse. And they thought surely Jesus would say, stone her. But he didn't. Because Jesus did not come to this world as, as our Savior to die on the cross for our sins. He didn't come to this world uh, to, for us to live by the law. He came to this world to, uh, for us to live by grace and mercy. And I'm so glad tonight that I live under grace and mercy. How about you? But secondly, and tonight, the assembly. What was it about these men? What was it about these people? We know they were malicious. We know that they thought Jesus would condemn this woman. We know all of this. But there are some other things they would rather have not known about Jesus. A lot of times people come to church and they sit here for different reasons. You may be one of those tonight. You came for a different reason. Maybe you came uh, because uh, you like to hear the singing or you came because your friends go here. Or you came, I mean, I don't know the reasons, but a lot of times people come to church for a lot of different reasons. And here they are, and they brought this woman uh, to Jesus, but there are some other things that they didn't know about him and that he knew about them. The first thing they, that Jesus knew and Jesus showed them is that their sins were not hidden. And by the way, folks, can I say something to you tonight? Your sins are not hidden. God sees you here tonight. The very state you're in, He sees you. He knows your heart. He knows all about you. Notice what Jesus said to them in John 8, 7. He said, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. You see, that's not just a flippant uh, thing that Jesus is saying there. He knows these men. He knew everything about He knew their hearts. And he knew when he said this to them, it would click on a light. That they would know that he's more than just a man. That he is more than just mortal. The Bible even says about this uh, in verse 8, And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. You see, after he asks them this question, he gives them a little time to think about it, kind of like he does you in the congregation when you come to church. He'll convict your heart with truth. And by the way, can I say that? What he said to them was truth. And he convicted their heart with truth, so... If you're sitting in a service like this tonight and your heart is under conviction, listen, it's not a lie. What he's saying to you is the truth. Because he knows you in an intimate way. He knows everything about you. He knows your heart. It's not because you have some loud preacher up here preaching. It's because the Holy Spirit is moving on your heart. You see, the truth of the matter is that most people have things in their lives they would rather not other people know about it. In churches on Sunday all over America and all over the world, there are people that have things in their life that they really don't want others to know about them. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus knows. And when he convicts your heart of those things, it's truth. Oh, the devil will come to you when you're convicted like that, and the devil will come to you and say, Oh, you're just being emotional. 
it's an emotional service and, and you're just being emotional. I'm here to tell you when the Holy Spirit convicts your heart, it was like Jesus talking to those men. He convicted their heart because he knew their sin. And by the way, he knows yours. So that's the way Jesus works. So the next time you or I as sinners decide that we're going to pass judgment on someone else, let's do this. Ask yourself three things. Everybody with me, say amen. I hope you remember these because you're going to need them. The first thing we ought to ask ourselves before we pass judgment on other people is this. Is my heart clean before God? Look at your own self. Check yourself out. And by the way, folks, probably we, when we check ourselves like that, we probably need to get some things clean. A clean heart. So before you judge anybody else, make sure your own heart's clean before God. And secondly, you need to ask yourself, am I without sin? And how many would say, no? All right, let's try that one more time. How many would say, no? I'm not without sin. You're not without sin. None of us are without sin. All of sin comes short. All of us. So we're going to ask the question before we judge others. Is my heart clean before God? Secondly, am I without sin? And thirdly, do I criticize others when at the same time I'm guilty of the same thing? Because, folks, if we asked ourselves those three questions before we judge other people, most of the time we won't judge. We will know who we are. And not only that, we will know that God knows who we are. I think if we do that, we'll put a stop to most of our criticism. Secondly, their sins were revealed. Now, I don't mean to say this, but listen to me. Sometimes God just reveals our sin. You can't hide sin from God. He'll reveal it. Did he with David? Did he? So you think you're better than David? Sooner or later, it's going to come out. Be sure your sin will find you out. That's what God says. Be sure your sin will find you out. Their sins were revealed. Notice how Jesus revealed their sin. In verse 9, he tells tells us uh, that he did not uh, ignore their accusations, but what he did was, is he reached down with his finger. Let's read it. Let's read what it says. It says there... Um, in verse, let me find it. Verse 9, when he heard being convicted, stooped down and wrote on the ground. Verse 8. I was looking at verse 9. It says, and again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. So here he is among all these men that he knows their heart. He knows who they are. He knows that they're hypocrites. He knows that. And then he starts to write on the ground. Now, the Bible really never says, but I believe he wrote their sins on the ground. Remember now the setting. They're in a church setting. There's thousands probably of people there. People that knows these scribes and Pharisees. You know, they were big in the community. They knew these, uh, these scribes and Pharisees. Their intent was to bring this woman and embarrass her, but Jesus ends up embarrassing them. The Bible says he wrote on the ground. And I believe he wrote their sins. Now, it doesn't really tell us that, but I believe it was, and you're going to see that in just a moment. What Jesus wrote, whatever it was about them, it sure brought conviction, didn't it? I have no doubt in my mind that that Jesus revealed the sins of these men. I bet they had some explaining to do. 
Because you know in all this vast crowd that there were probably uh, you know, people that were kin to them and there were gossips and there were all kinds of people. And I'm sure when Jesus started writing their hidden sins out on the ground that, that these people, you know, they looked at these people and thought about them as respectable, but they weren't respectable. They were sinners in deep need of a Savior. Jesus wrote it in the sand. And I'm sure that day that the telephone lines were burned up with people telling the sins of these scribes and Pharisees. How many of you believe in the law of sowing and reaping? Amen. They wasn't expecting to reap. They weren't expecting to get what they got, but they got it anyway. Listen to me. Look at me. You do not hide your sin and sins forever. God will tell on you. Amen? God will tell on you. And when he tells on you, he'll tell the whole story, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So all their hidden sins were out in the open now, and everybody knew about it. And, and whatever we do or say about others, I'm here to tell you, whatever you do or say about others will soon come out, and it'll come back to bite you. Because when you talk about a brother or sister in Christ, what you're doing, or you're doing something bad to a brother or sister in Christ, let me tell you something, God will not put up with it because that's his son or daughter. And he won't put up with it. It'll come back to you. So let's not be a part of that assembly of the accusers. I'm sure glad that God is the one who shreds our sins to pieces. I'm sure glad that God's the one that casts my sin as far as the east is from the west as as deep as the ocean. I, I'm glad that He forgives my sin, aren't you? And all I have to do is get on my knees and confess to Him. Confession is good for the soul. That's a truth. That's truth, isn't it? When you get like you did maybe this morning, some of you, maybe, maybe that's what you were doing. I don't know what you were doing. That's between you and God, but maybe that's what you did. Didn't you feel so much better when you got up this morning and left this place? Didn't you feel as light as a feather and like, man, the whole world, uh, you know, mountains were lifted off your shoulders and, man, God has forgiven you and you're clean and you're ready to go? And that's what God wants. The third and last thing. He's our advocate. Look at 1 John 2, 1. We see this in the story plain. It's as plain as plain can do be. Look at 1 John 2, 1, what it says here about him being our advocate. It says, My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have a what? Advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I have a heavenly lawyer. That goes before God for me. You see, it's not just the act of getting on my knees and praying. It's not just seeing somebody praying and thinking, man, they're praying. Listen, when you see somebody on their knees, a Christian on their knees praying, they're in the very throne room of God. And I think we forget that. I think we forget how precious prayer is. Just like this morning when I came in and seen all of you on the altar, I thought to myself, now isn't that precious? Isn't that something? Isn't that something? But folks, you know what? That shouldn't surprise us. That shouldn't be a surprise to us when we come here seeing people on the altar. That shouldn't be a surprise. You want to know why? Because that's what we're supposed to do. But we've gotten away from it. We've gotten away from using the altar and, and praying and talking to God and, and, and uh, intercessory prayer and all these things. We've gotten away from it, and we should have never gotten away from it, but it's the work of the devil that does that. He's our heavenly lawyer. 
John 8, 9 and 10 says it this way. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had lifted up himself and, and saw no one but the woman, he said in her, Woman, where's, where's your accusers? Where are they at now? Hath no man condemned thee? He is our defense attorney. We all stand guilty tonight, including me. I'm guilty. You are too, amen? We all stand guilty before God tonight. The charge is sin. The charge on all of us is sin. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We deserve it. We deserve to die because we're sinners. We're wicked. But then the Bible also says in Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I think I'm going to read that one more time because that's a good verse, isn't it? Listen to it again. In Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We're under grace. Jesus paid for our sins. We're condemned because of our sins, but Jesus paid for them. And because of his payment on the cross of Calvary, he declares you and me tonight not guilty. When we sin and take it to Jesus Christ and our heavenly attorney takes it to God, he says to God about us, that's my child. He's under the blood. He's been saved. And God says he's forgiven. Same thing about you. That's who we are. That's what we are in, in Jesus Christ, not guilty. He is now our intercessor before God. The Apostle John said it this way in 1 John 2, 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. Hallelujah! Our sins are forgiven. Aren't you glad tonight you're forgiven? Aren't you happy tonight you're forgiven? But the devil wants to keep you thinking you're not forgiven. That's his job. He wants you to leave this church tonight thinking you're lost and not saved and not going to heaven. If he can keep you down, he'll keep you down. But I'm going to read you that verse one more time where you can just smack him in the face with it. Write it down. Mark it down. Read it to the devil when he comes at you. 1 John 2, 12, I write unto you, little children, are you his child? You say to the devil, I'm his child. I'm a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He paid, you tell the devil, He paid for my sins. I'm forgiven. I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free indeed. How about you? I write unto you, little children, that's me and you, because your sins plural, are forgiven you for His name's sake. Because of Jesus. I'm going to give you one more thing. He's also our divine authority. When all the assembly, you know, when they run away like scalded dogs, and that's what happened to them, after Jesus showed what they really were, He, he told everybody their sins. It's kind of like, I mean, folks, it's an embarrassing thing, but it's kind of like he stood him and said, now this is John, and John is this and this, and he's done this, he's done that, he's done this. I mean, that's kind of what he did. How many of you want to stand up here and him do that? But that's what he did to these men. And the Bible says from the eldest to the youngest, <laughs> they left in a hurry. They got out of there. They was afraid he'd tell them something else. And there you have the story, and you can see it tonight. Just picture it in your mind. There it is. They're gone. Everybody's gone. And the only ones there is the Lord and the woman. 
Oh, by the way, that's the way it is. That's the way it always is. I'm not saved because my wife's saved. My wife couldn't do that for me. My mama couldn't do it for me. My dad, my sisters, this church couldn't do it for me. It had to be between me and the Lord. So if you're saved tonight, if you've been saved, if you can actually say in your heart and life, if you could stand tonight and say, I'm saved, there had to be a time that there was just you and the Lord. The Bible says there they are. They're the only ones that remain, the Lord and this poor old woman. And Jesus turned and said to this poor old woman, Woman, where are, the, where are those thine accusers? Where are they at? Where's the ones that just brought you here in that awful state that they found you in? Are you getting this or am I just getting it? Are you getting how wonderful this is? I mean, just minutes before, she was caught in a horrible sin. That sin recommended death. 99 out of 100 people that were brought in that sin were killed. Stoned, a horrible death. But she's one out of a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand that's standing there and it's just her and the Lord. And he says to her, where's your accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Listen to her response. And she in return said in John 8, 11, I bet she is crying by this time. Because I'm sure she was so convicted and so horrified of the things she had done. And she looked Jesus in his piercing eyes and said, No man, Lord. Boy, hallelujah, what a response. And Jesus looked back at this woman that had just been caught in the very, in the very act of adultery and he looked at her and he said to her neither do I condemn thee you remember when he said that to you what man my heart was so hardened and full of sin and do, do you remember am I, am I talking uh, do you know what I'm talking about your heart was just so full of unrighteousness and sin and all that horrible stuff. Jesus looked at you and said the very same words. Neither do I condemn you. What he was really saying is you're free. You're free. You're free from all that sin that you built up over all those years and all those days. and You're free. I've wiped them clean. You have not. Go and sin no more. Jesus, who is the divine authority, if he says forgiven, then that means forgiven. If Jesus has said to you, you're forgiven, listen to me. I don't care what any man or woman says. I don't care what kind of judgment they pass on your life. Listen, if Jesus said you're forgiven, you're forgiven. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what others think about you. Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. He's the Lord of new beginnings. Of a newness in your heart that no man or woman could ever put there. Only Jesus can put it there. 
There is nothing in this world like salvation. You can't explain it because it's so unreal. It cleans you up when AA couldn't. It cleans you up and sets you free. How do you know you're saved, preacher? I know because He lives in my heart. I've never been the same for all these years. Have I always been, uh, you know, perfect? Have I never committed sin? No, I'm not saying that, but I've never been the same since Jesus came into my heart. Never. This woman knew it right away. She knew it right away. Never had she seen a man like this. Never had she talked to a person like this. Never has she had seen the love and mercy and grace in a person like this. And you can say the same thing. Never. This woman was forgiven. She was able to begin all over again. You remember when you began all over again? But now I want to talk to you just a second. Look at me. I'm going to quit right now. Maybe you got cold and indifferent on God. Maybe life has thrown you a few curves and a few valleys and a few hardships. and Maybe a relationship that you were in was horrible and, and you, know, you can't get over what they did and who they are and what they said and all the things that go along with that. Maybe you was raised, and when you were raised, your daddy wasn't the daddy he should have been, or your mama wasn't the mom she should have been. I mean, all these things are in our society, and you know I'm telling you that. And it's a, it's a, a lie of the devil. The devil has put that in families and homes to keep us from having all that God wants us to have. People come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and they live in this horrible pit because they just won't let go. And I say to you, Jesus is looking at you tonight. And he's saying the same thing to you as he said to this woman. Where's your accusers? Where are they at? Where's the ones that condemned you? Where are they at? Jesus said, I forgive you, and I love you, and I'll be with you till the very end. And what we've got to do, folks, is just give everything to Jesus. Just bring it to him. Romans 8, 1 says in ending this service tonight, After we get saved, and I believe the same thing to this woman, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but... Did you read that word? Two words, no condemnation. I think we ought to say it together, no Condemnation. Let's say it again. No condemnation. That's you. Listen. Jesus loves you so much, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. None. Well, that's good news. That's good news, isn't it? Good news. Lord Jesus, we love you. And we thank you, Father, for all you've done for us. And we thank you for today and tonight. We believe, Father, that you've touched our hearts. And that you're doing things in our lives. And we believe there's great things ahead of us in this church. We believe you want to do wonderful things here. Father, we just ask tonight that you'll help us to be all that we need to be. Help us to fall on our face before you. 
confess our sins, repent. And Lord, you said that you would use us. Thank you for what you're going to do right now. Now, you may be in this service tonight and God has spoke to you. There's no sense in sitting there. It doesn't matter if you came this morning or not. You may need to come tonight. But right now, while God is moving, while God is moving on your heart right now, would you step out from where you are and come? Yeah, come on. You're not by yourself. Will you come right now? Lord, I, I'm tired of living with this condemnation. I'm tired of living with things that happened to me in the past and things people said about me in the past. I'm tired of living like this, and I'm not going to live like this no more. I'm going to hand it over to you right now. Would you come right now? We're going to dismiss in about three or four minutes. Would you come right now? Step out from where you are. Would you come? Would you come?